America. My name is Harvey Jose Frimpong. Coming to you live every Friday as I do uh, to talk to you about the news. It's a little bit old. Look, I got a backlog of shows I'd like to do. I got a list. Maybe I could come out with more than one video a week, but I also have other jobs. But we're going to finally talk about all the cops that are killing black people and what that means. And, and not in an obvious way. I try to do things that are not in an obvious way. First, we start out with show them. Uh, the, the, the Chauvin conviction. Look, justice will never come for black people through the courts, right? If white people are deciding which um, black people to elevate and which white people to punish, it's all the same scam to get us buying into their system. That wasn't, the verdict wasn't about us. It was about them uh, resuscitating their police department. And we should know that. So that was quickly about the Chauvin victim. I'll, I'll say, I'll reiterate some of these points afterwards. I want to talk then about Micaiah Bryant. Micaiah Bryant was the foster kid who, it looks like everybody failed, uh, who was gunned down by a police officer. It's funny because that police officer came out, we're going to watch a video after the opening, came out, like, took two looks and then drew his gun. Not his, not his taser, he drew his gun and then shot Micaiah Bryant while Micaiah Bryant was right next to somebody else, put four slugs in her. Now, I, I've never actually fired a gun. I've, I've had a gun in my face, and I did not like that. But I've never actually fired a gun. Uh, but I know enough to know that, you know, you are ready to kill somebody when you draw it. And there was someone right next to her, right? So he could have just killed everybody by mistake. And you could say that, like, well, and then you read about him, and you find out he was a uh, sharpshooter in the military or whatever. And you're like, okay, then why didn't he just shoot her in the butt or the leg? So it's a one way. Either, either you can't expect police officers to uh, to um, be able to discriminate, uh, to, to 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 shoot people in in, in non lethal ways. Which I actually don't expect police officers to shoot people in non lethal ways. I think if you draw your gun, you're ready to kill somebody. Or if you're going to shoot somebody, don't shoot somebody when they're next to somebody else. Right. So um, besides the fact that I've seen too many high school teachers break up too many fights. And also, we don't know that that wasn't a butter knife. How come I haven't seen the knife? Show me the knife. I want to see the knife. I feel like if the knife were really that egregious, um, the police would have released an evidence photo of the knife. Someone told me they've seen the knife and it's a butter knife. It's one of these jobs. And um, and the reason they won't release a picture of the knife is because... They don't want to admit that, like, this is what, you know, Makai was trying to, uh, you know, do harm to her uh, friends of her mom's. All right, so that's a very complicated story because the mom, the foster mom was supposed to create a, a safe environment for Makai, but my, the foster mom was calling over her previous foster daughters um, when the foster mom isn't home. And the previous foster daughters have a record of harassing Micaiah. And depending on who you talk to, the mom was um, uh, instigating the older foster daughters like, and turning them against Micaiah. So I think the foster mom, we need to talk about the foster mom not creating a safe environment for her daughter, for the foster daughter. So like that girl shouldn't be, shouldn't, shouldn't die, you know, if you see someone, if you if you if you have Kevlar and you see someone, uh, a, a, you know, a young woman attacking another young woman, can't you tackle them? Um, it's sure knives are very dangerous, but they're not easy, <laughs> right? They're not easy. So, like I said, I've seen enough uh, fights broken up without four slugs. Lastly, the one I'm going to talk about is this other. Uh, this other cop shooting where everyone was just lying about it. There's this, this, this story changed about 16 different times. And so we're going to talk about like the many iterations of this story. But I think I'll just tell you right now, I think every white person involved is lying from the cops to this mom. Uh, this uh, white mom called her daughter's boyfriends on her, uh, called the cops on her daughter's boyfriend and the cops went in and killed him. And so she called a hit out, except she lied about calling a hit, except the truth comes out and then she totally called a hit. So with that, I'm going to hit the uh, intro and then we're going to come back and break down each of the developments in time. To the beach, oh. Oh, yeah. Sound 
good to me. Never change the ways for the world or the government. If it was the president, then I would state facts. You leave it up to me, I'll paint the White House black and it can feature in your front. Okay, we're back. So first, let's start with the Chauvin, Chauvin case, right? Everyone saw George Floyd die last year. And y- you have to understand that this is steam control for white supremacy. White supremacy needs to get you to buy into the judicial system, a criminal justice system that was meant to catch us, not emancipate us or secure justice for us. Uh, everyone saw George Floyd die. And so this is, uh, this is like, I was trying to explain, this is like a mob enforcer going to jail for not snitching right the cops are going to take care of the mob enforcers family Chauvin's people are going to be fine Chauvin's kids are going to be cops they're like the mob is going to take care of its own Chauvin has to go to jail but since Chauvin didn't snitch um he'll do his time and he'll be ta- and his people will get taken care of like the police the 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 fraternal order of police or whatever are going to take care of his family take care of everything else this is a mob snitch or this is a mob enforcer going to jail for not snitching and going to do his bid while the same um system just kind of calcifies make no mistake this is steam control and the first hint should have been that the most excited demographic um the people who are the most excited about this trial and eventual verdict were liberal white women because they need the justice system to be just. They need it to be fair. Right? Um, because like it doesn't arrest them and they get to sick people on them. Uh, use it. So they were the most excited about the, the Chauvin going to, uh, to jail. Because it, it redeemed them so that they can continue to sick it on us um, with impunity. So they love it. They love the they identify this with justice, and they love it. They don't identify justice with like thinking, well, why? I mean, like, what was going on in George Floyd's life? Like, we're, we're gonna get him a job. They don't think in terms of jobs for justice because, you know, white women don't have to work. They work when they want to. So what? Um, that class, the aspirational, the aspirational, <laughs> the the aspiration is to have the option to work. When the aspiration is to have the option to work, your first question isn't going to be, you know, it's unfortunate that George Floyd didn't have a better job. Whereas my question, anytime I see a black person killed, it's like unfortunate that like they didn't have a more secure, better job. That's the same. That's what I talk uh, when I saw Eric Garner. I was like, it's unfortunate that he was he didn't have a better job. Last when I saw Alton Sperling hustling CDs at midnight, I was like, unfortunate he doesn't have a better job. Because if you have a better job, you can save up and like do your own distribution. That's not just selling CDs at midnight, right? So, um, I think of justice as like what's it going to take for Black people to get like real capital? Because this is a capitalist economy, and we don't have capital, so that means we're just disposable, right? And we're not like connected to capital in that way. But uh, other people think of justice as my being able to call the cops to put you in jail. A lot of these people are people who don't have to worry about jobs. All right, so. George Floyd, Chauvin, um, he was just a sacrificial lamb. But they're going to take care of all of Chauvin's people. So there was no justice there. That's not going to be, there's no long term strategy. And anytime they have you cheering for a, a verdict, a criminal justice verdict, like it's not about us. It's about trying to legitimize the system. And I'm going to talk about, a little bit about this when I go on Rising next time. Um, but the, the goal is assimilation. The goal is assimilation without actually having to change. So in order to get white supremacy proves itself and makes itself valid by being able to accept all of the diversity possible, even diverse outcomes, like occasionally sending a cop to jail without actually changing its structure. As long as you don't have to change policing, like we'll send a few cops to jail and that will actually strengthen our structure especially if it'll take the stink off the fact that, like, you know, we have a, a, a Negro catcher uh, in our police force. Like, that's, that's, that's the job of the police force, which I think is unfortunate, rather than securing us rights and welfare, All right? So that's the problem with Chauvin's victory. It doesn't actually, it actually takes the stink off of the criminal justice system rather than reforms it. I don't want to send more white cops to jail. I just want to defund police. I want fewer cops and more good jobs for black people 
building things that the community needs. I still think my idea of a cultural archive is probably one of the most important ideas of the 21st century. That would be every time you hit every, a person who hits 65 or 70, they schedule, they get a visit by a three person videography team to tell their side of the story. That person comes one day on a Saturday and then comes a week later to get another hour and a half. Boom. And that person gets to tell their side of the story into the camera. And then it's just uploaded onto the Library of Congress. You know, it's a digital archive, so you can just search it, right? And that would be, the, that would be our cultural archive because that would make sure that working class and poor and black people actually get to have their side of the story in a place where nobody can get it. <laughs> so that's what I think should happen. Um, and I think, you know, people like George Floyd should be one of those three people on the video team that goes to classes, to houses, and, and gets paid good excuse me, good money to do that. We need a cultural archive that's not just market-based where people who can pay to have biographies written about them or ghostwriters do that. Uh, or like, no, everybody gets it. As a right and an American, you get to tell your side of the story for three hours, one hour and a half, one week, the next week, another hour and a half. And that's just what you get for turning 65 or 70 in this nation. And we have the digital capacity. I was just thinking about this with all the, um, what you call it, the alt currency the, the Bitcoins and the Dodge coins and the Ether. Um, if we have the capacity to do that, we have the capacity to host this kind of digital archive where everyone else gets three hours to tell their side of the story. What happened in the 60s? What happened in the 70s? What happened in the 80s? What happened in the 90s? What happened in the 2000s? Like you get to tell your side, boom, then it's in the archive. Then you get to reflect for a week and then tell the other half of your side <laughs> the next week. All right, so... Um, those are the kinds of jobs I think we should be doing and the government should pay us to do. So I've talked about Chauvin. Now let's go to Makai Bryant. So Makai Bryant was a foster, uh, a 16 year old foster girl. Uh, you know, the, the system is already broken. Uh, the foster care system is already dubious, but her foster mom created an unsafe environment for her that ended up with her being killed. And you can say, well, the foster mom wasn't home when the sisters were harassing her when they started fighting. Well, the foster mom called the sisters. Uh, they're not sisters. They're, they're the other, they're the, foster, they're, they're the adult former foster children of this same foster mom who were there harassing Makai Bryant. And Makai Bryant called the cops, and the cops came and shot her. And you can say, well, you know, she was brandishing a weapon. Yeah, but here's the deal. She could be brandishing that weapon. But if you don't already have, if you have a stun gun drawn instead of, uh, you know, your, the weapon that kills, if you have the weapon that's stunned, because I found out that all Columbus police officers are issued a stun gun. If you have a stun gun drawn, then you stun her instead of put four slugs in her. You have the, and it's on a different hip, which means you didn't grab it by mistake. You wanted to pull your real gun. And th make no mistake, this cop was not under immediate danger. Right? Right? So, like, this wasn't self protection. This was to stop someone else from doing something to somebody else, which, you know, is legal under the law, but I, you know, I, I, why don't you go for your stun gun? And here's the deal a, a friend told me that, look, they have the real gun on their dominant side, not because. Um, of emergency situations, but to establish dominance, right? They, uh, cops don't die through gunfight. They die through car crashes because they drive like maniacs. And um, it's all about dominance. They could put the stun gun on the dominant side and that would be just fine too. You can do a lot of things. Like I said, I've seen a lot of teachers break up a lot of fights and I've never had to call for a service weapon. So there is that. Um, and like I said, we don't know the knife, right? We don't know the knife. I think if it wasn't a butter knife, if it wasn't something like this, we think it, like we fill in our imaginations on what the knife is, but why hasn't it been released? Show me the knife. Show me the knife. Because if we find out it was a butter knife, then it really doesn't matter. Um, and like I, you know, I, I heard that it was. We haven't seen it yet. The Columbus Police Department could make a liar out of me real quickly by just showing me a picture of the knife. I've seen pictures of, every time there's a drug raid, I get all these pictures of drugs everywhere. And that's very good art that the police wants to, uh, to, to show me. I want to see pictures of the knife. This knife is the exculpatory evidence. Show me the knife. Show me the knife. 
But in order for me to see the knife, now I need the DA to press charges, and so the knife becomes an exhibit. No, I want the police to show me the knife because I think there, I, I have a feeling that this knife isn't what our imagination wants us to believe it is. In which case, one, this cop should have uh, drawn his stun gun to begin with, and two, um, you know, there's a lot going on with that, right? So here, let me, I, have, I, I got the video, so let me just... Let me just... Uh, um, Actually, let me put the video here. I do my own producing, so, you know, you're welcome. By the way, if you appreciate anything I do, and you should, because I'm trying to give a quality of insight that you're not going to get on the mainstream news, go ahead and go over to www.funkyacademic.com and kick in $5.15 or $50 a month. And I like the monthlies because it allows me the budget and, um, you know, help me grow this little thing that I do. And here's the video. We turn now to yet another police-involved killing. 16-year-old Micaiah Bryant shot dead by Columbus, Ohio, police officer Nicholas Reardon. Tonight, investigators are examining police-worn body camera footage as well as video taken from a neighbor's security camera showing Micaiah appearing to hold a knife and then lunging at someone wearing pink. Officer Reardon fires a burst of deadly shots. We're joined now by ABC's Trevor Alt. Thanks so much for joining us, Trevor. What's the latest on the investigation into Micaiah's death? Uh, thanks for having me, Lindsay. Today we got a, a few different, more well-rounded views of what happened in this shooting. One of them, that surveillance footage from the neighbor across the street. He was a witness only in hearing the shots, but his security cameras captured the incident as it unfolded. And another video was released by the city police, and those are the dash cam videos from the officers as they arrived on scene. And it is worth noting, Lindsay, that there wasn't a lot of new information revealed by these new videos because the city and the police department took that unprecedented step to release some of the body camera footage within just a few hours after this fatal shooting. And so we have a, a fairly good understanding of what was seen there as this was playing out as Micaiah Bryant is seen on that video with a knife in her hand appearing to lunge uh, at another young girl. And that's when the officer Nicholas Reardon. So I'm saying if you if you're. If you're good enough to take, uh, if you're, if you're good enough to take the shot, to put four, uh, hold on, I think. So. Yeah, I was just checking out. I, you know, I, I, I got a lot of kids at home, and I want to make sure that they're, they're, they're good. Um, but it turns out there was no big, no big deal. All right, so. So what's what's going on? How if you're a good enough shot where you could put four uh, slugs in someone at the at the range and not hit the girl in pink and feel comfortable doing that, then you're good enough to to wound and not kill somebody, right? That's the issue, right? And also, why are you initially drawing your gun and not your taser, right? Why is that the go-to? My go-to is to kill. My go-to is to kill. Then why even have a taser if that's not going to be, like there's a ladder, there's an escalation of violence, right? So you can say, well, you know, he didn't know it was a butter knife. Even if it was a butter knife, it's not a big deal. It is kind of a big deal um, because there are other options. It is kind of a big deal because there are other options, right? So if you don't, if, you, if you're not in the position to know if it's a butter knife or a butcher knife, and you're not in a position to know whether this person's like an assassin or a killer or just someone who's really mad, then go for the taser, right? So if it's not, if it's, it's, if it's not homicide, it's at least like, I don't know, negligence, some variety of negligence. And uh, I would be very wary, even if I were the girl in pink, uh, like parents, like, why are you shooting so close to my kid? <laughs> like if you if you have that kind of aim to make that shot, you have the aim to save Makai Bryant's life. And if you don't have the kind of aim to make that shot, then it was really irresponsible of you. Uh, you have Kevlar on, just tackle. You have Kevlar on. Um, this was a this was a murder of convenience. This was a murder of convenience, and um, I don't know. So. And also, the mom's job is to create, the foster mom's job is to create an environment, a safe environment. And that was, 
that's an abject failure. That's an abject failure of creating a safe environment. Um, a, a, a safe environment, right? So until I see that this wasn't the knife, I want to see the knife. I want to see the knife in an exhibit. And if I don't, until that, like I, I, I'm, I'm not comfortable with a lot of aspects about the case. All right. So now the last bit uh, to deal with this one. Now this is funny because not funny, haha. Funny as in like bizarre because the story changed so much this 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 was a movie <laughs> trying to get something like this and like i said before i think every white person involved in this is lying 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 um so the mom calls the cops on the kid in this article the mom says that she told the cops that she didn't talk she didn't tell the cops the kid had a gun but yet the cops like scrambled a helicopter and they came in hot so as soon as I saw that, I was like, "This I want to see. I want to hear the 911 call because I think this woman's lying." And it turns out when when they released the 911 call, the woman's lying, and she told the cops um, she had a gun. The, the kid had a gun, right? So I I it's like the mom succeeded in shaking up the uh, the soda and then opening up and then giving it to somebody else to open up and having it explode, right? So the the mom functionally called a hit on it, but like did so by mistake. Or just out of a general just neglect for uh, neglect for black life. Now the mom also said, "Well, the kids have been fighting, and they fight, and it's well known that this couple fights." And what you might not know about uh, both interracial violence is literature on this, both interracial violence and black violence. And it turns out um, even more so in interracial violence, interracial couple violence. Anytime there's violence, it's bidirectional. Not anytime like it's bidirectional as in like it's people fighting. It's people fighting. It's not necessary. Don't just assume that um, just because you see marks on a woman that there also aren't marks on the guy, <laughs> right? So what happened was this girl came home with some hair pulled out was, and, 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 uh, and some marks, and then she told her mom that um, she was fighting with her boyfriend. And so, and, and the mom knows that they've, you know, fought for a while. But we, um, but, and the assumption in the press is like he was beating her. Well, or they were just fighting, right? Because I think we don't know anything about this family. And for all I know, this mom hits her daughter like every day since the daughter was 10. And the daughter's pretty violent herself. Having been hit by a few women and just don't talk about it because no one really believes me or cares. I, like I, I have very little problem to believe, like believing that like, you know, these were fighting. They were fighting. So let's, um, and like, it's, it's, it breaks people's brains that women hit. And uh, even when the data says, like, depending on which study you read, sometimes they start more. Now, there is an asymmetry here insofar as uh, it'll be like Ray Rice, where the girlfriend will spit on Ray Rice and then claw at him and then he'll punch her. So, like, the severity of the violence um, is, is usually worse. Um, on women, but in term, in terms of instigating and actually fighting, especially in uh, in in racialized poor and racialized communities, it's more bidirectional than and, and than people think, right? So, um, just nobody talks about it because nobody wants to hear men be victims. So I'm gonna play you a clip and then talk about it a little bit. He was a good person in general. You know what I'm saying? Like anybody that ever needed anything, he was there. We're learning more about the student who police say is the suspect in the case from his girlfriend. So that was the girlfriend talking about uh, that was the girlfriend. And like we don't know anything about their relationship. We don't know anything about their relationship. I have every reason like uh, and the news articles just say that the kids were fighting. They don't say that he beats her, except everyone kind of interprets that as him beating her and not like they are like external stressors like lead them to be violent or that she grew up herself in a violent household um, and that her mom beats her. And so uh, it's, um, yeah, yeah. And the first news story that came out with this was that the kid had shot the cops, but then the cops retaliated. But then it turns out that one cop shot another cop and 
honestly, it's still an open question whether the kid actually had a gun because there have been so many conflicting stories. But we do know that one cop shot another cop and then the kid ended up dead. Um, so the story changes. Every white person involved, I think uh, every white person involved, especially every white adult, is just lying about um, the situation that's going on with this, with this boy who was killed. So, that's what I think about the last one, the, about the cops, uh, the, the mom calling the cops on her daughter's boyfriend, even admitting that, yes, they had been fighting, and they fight, which means, that doesn't mean he beats her, that means that they are fighting, right? They are fighting, except one guy, except one person ends up dead by cop. Right. And we don't until we don't know anything about the relationship. So if you just and anyone, honestly, I, I have I was talking to somebody about this and they, they always just go to the woman's side and go to the cop side and just knee jerk and knee jerk, assuming that neither party was lying. And then the like the information started coming out. The 911 call was released and it turns out the mom was lying about telling the cops that the kid had a gun. And it turns out that the police was lying about the kid shooting first. And it turns out it was another cop who shot a cop because this all happened in a bathroom. One cop shoots another cop and then the third cop shoots the kid. <laughs> right. Um, and that's how it went down. And all because these two teenagers were fighting. And we don't know, like, you try to exonerate it by saying that, like, he was beating her. No, there was no reason to believe anything like that. There is every reason to believe that, you know, these kids fight. And, you know, it's complicated because poor black love is complicated. Poor black teen love is especially complicated. But there you go. That's my thought. Hey, look, you're not going to hear anybody talk like this in the mainstream media because this isn't how you get sponsors <laughs> talking about bi-directional violence and maybe that, uh, you know, maybe she hit him or and, and, and that like the mom is just lying, lying, lying. And that why couldn't the cop either draw the stun gun initially or tackle um, uh, Micaiah Bryant or if you're such a good shot, like well, the girl in Pink's life was in danger. Like, not necessarily from Micaiah Bryant, but from the cop. And if he's that good of a shot, good shot, that means he could have shot her in the butt or the leg. So, like, he was just putting everybody else in danger. And bullets ricochet. Like, I, I just don't understand how you lead with a gun and then start opening. Like, I, 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 don't, I don't understand that. That's not how I understand gun safety. But if you like what I'm saying, go ahead and kick over five, fifteen, dollars or $50 to... Uh, uh, a month to www.funkyacademic.com. And also, nobody else is going to tell you that Chauvin going to jail is like a, a mob enforcer snitch. I mean, who doesn't snitch? A mob enforcer who doesn't snitch. Chauvin's family is going to be fine. There's a low-key money being passed around to take care of all the Chauvin's and all the Chauvin's offspring. He was a lamb sacrificed for, the, on the, for white supremacy. And... The, most, the people who are most excited about this verdict, I'll tell you, are going to be liberal white women who want to believe in the cops because the cops work for them. Peace. Knowledge and insight that will help you not squander your life and kind of rescue meaning from it, then go ahead and go to www.funkyacademic.com and kick in $5, $15, or $50 a month or enormous donations. I like the monthlies because it allows me to budget more and that'll help me, you know, with a marketing budget or getting better equipment that works all the time because a lot of, in a lot of ways, freedom means having equipment that works every time you turn it on. <laughs> and I want to be a free Negro. So um, if you like what I do, go to funkyacademic.com and contribute. Thanks often comes in the form of cash and the site takes credit cards. If you appreciate the work I do every week and you think that I should continue to do it because I'm giving you the quality of political knowledge and insight